È un grande piacere per me essere qui. I'm going to speak in English, but I cannot. I see the balance here is rather dangerous, but let's hope that it all works out. I'm going to put it here. Um, allora voglio sempre parlare un po' l'italiano, lo pratico, non lo parlo molto bene. Comunque è un grande piacere essere qui e, um, e, e voglio veramente anche imparare qualcosa. Non sono mai stata in questa bellissima città, mia famiglia ha vissuto a Roma per vent'anni, una cosa così. So now I switch to English, don't despair those who don't speak Italian. Um, so here are just a few elements as background. Uh, I work on big cities, and you know that when you invited me to speak at this meeting for uh, small cities. Big cities are in big trouble. So it is very interesting actually to be at a meeting that is focusing on small or medium-sized cities. I do think that it's to the benefit of most residents. I don't know if most businesses to be in a small or medium-sized city. Our big cities are running into trouble. Part of the trouble in big cities, something that you, we do not yet see in small cities, uh, is the buying up of housing, all kinds of housing complexes, big, big housing complexes, by financial firms. This is something that you don't see happening in small cities. And that's just one example. I am going to talk a bit about this whole question of how finance is engaging the materialities of urban space. This is actually a fairly alarming trend. And I'm sure that in Trento, it's not, but that in Rome, this is also happening there. So the, this is sort of one image I want to use as background image. This notion that financial firms and other types of investment firms are buying big pieces of housing in cities, especially big complexes. So that is a bit of background. Now, uh, let, let me just uh, put in, I can't help myself, I'm an academic, um, we academics really have some problems. Uh, but the question of method, how we study, and so I have become almost radically critical of some of the strategies that we have had in the social sciences, which have narrowed, sort of we are working in narrow silos that have less and less, and I think we need to cut across. To understand some of the issues that I want to talk about, we really have to exit those silos. For instance, if high finance is interested in financializing low-income, huge housing complexes, you know, we need to recognize that. That's a very significant element. The methodologies that we are deploying, I think, still dominantly for cities, do not get at that. A poor housing complex is seen as a poor housing complex. From the financial perspective, it's an asset. And you know what? We're running out of assets in the world. High finance, which is algorithmic mathematics, it has nothing to do with traditional economics or you know, microeconomics. <coughs> High finance is in search of assets. I would not be surprised if some buying has already happened in this beautiful city of yours. But it certainly is happening in many major cities. So this is sort of uh, a background. Uh, it's the, the before method element. Uh, I repeat, I think that in order to understand some of these trends that I want to discuss in some detail, we really have to exit a lot of the traditional formats that we have developed to understand cities. There is something else happening. Buildings are no longer just buildings. Via algorithmic mathematics, many complex steps, they become a field of assets. Un campo eh, di, di assets, no? Uh, now, in my research practice, since I'm interested in discovering rather than replicating, which is the dominant mode is replication, I sort of uh, develop a set of analytic tactics 
And there you have sort of a brief description. I don't want to dwell too much on that. I do think it's necessary to understand some of the features of the urban condition in today's world, especially I'm, I'm now talking about large cities, very large and often very rich cities. And so there are some of those uh, sort of uh, analytic tactics. For one, and I'm not going to dwell on all of them, the need to destabilize established categories. A house used to be simply a house. Today, a house, as I already said, can also be part of a mixture of assets, nothing to do with houseness, okay? uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't want to develop to, to dwell too much on this, but the second point is sort of important, this notion of how do we function, how do we discover, how, do we, how can we find new narratives in the shadow of, what is it that I say there, of powerful explanations. A powerful explanation is often an invitation not to think. It's so powerful that you say, well, that is it. No, we need to, we need to unsettle those very powerful explanations. Um, at the bottom of that list, you see something that I refer to as the making of it all. That is clearly a partial engagement. But I want to emphasize the extent to which we make. We have made not just these beautiful buildings, but also the disastrous conditions that we see in some of our cities. So, you know, the notion of the making of. Now, just a quick sort of just read this very quickly on the global city. I'm not going to be talking about the global city, but the global city represents a very particular historic moment when we privatize deregulate and globalize. And the 1980s marks the achievement. <laughs> I'm a bit of a critic of all of that, huh? the, but when it actually got done, when it got instantiated. And for me, when I, when I wrote about the global city, uh, the global city is, is, a, is a category for analysis. It's not a descriptive element. <coughs> The global city is one set of functions inside a city. It is not everything about the city. Um, now, moving into the depth of the, of the subject now, uh, two key features of today's Western economies that are insufficiently recognized, I think, in many analyses, and one is intermediation. And the other one is the financializing of it all. I already alluded to the financializing of it all, the capacity that high finance, I repeat, it is algorithmic mathematics, it is not microeconomics, the capacity that it has <coughs> to, uh, to financialize just about everything. And one example that I want to give you is how finance is financializing very low income housing complexes. The fact that there are low-income, huge housing complexes does not keep high finance from transforming that into assets because it's a materiality in play. Um, I want to give you just one quick example of this chart. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that in 2001, it was under a trillion. Six years later, 62 trillion. Secondly, those 62 trillion were just 10% of the total value, which was over 600 trillion, uh, that the high financial system had managed to produce. When you look at the total amount of currencies, it's less than that. What is it that we're looking at? We measure it in money, but it is not just about money. It is also really uh, an animal of its own. It's a capability. I'm going to skip this because it's too much. I don't know if people can, can you see this or not? Great. So I, I have a pointer here, right? I want you to, this is just data, of very modest, mostly very modest households. I want you to look 
at the top title here, ratio of household credit to personal disposable income. Credit sounds really nice. It's debt. Okay? Now, 2000 to 2005, this is a very critical period. Let's just take the Czech Republic. And you realize that this is when these countries had exited the, the prior regime, you know, but they were already entering the new Western-style economy. And then you have Czech Republic, household credit, again, debt, debt, credit sounds far too good, so 8.5%, five years later, 27%. Hungary, 11, 39. What's happening there? And if you go down, you know, look at the United States, 104, 105, 104, all the same, so, you know, very regular. Germany, 70, 70, 70, 70. What is happening up here? <coughs> what is happening up, I'm sorry, I just have to, what is happening up, up there in those top things is the entering of high financial firms into a sector of modest housing in Eastern Europe. And they're doing their job, and I will elaborate on that second part. Now, when I see that kind of stuff, I want to know who owns that household, modest household debt. So if a local bank owns that household debt, you say, okay, it's fine, the local bank wants the sons and daughters of its clients to do better, etc., etc. But no, that debt in Eastern Europe was owned by major foreign investors, and they were mostly German, most of it was German, uh, um, Austrian, and Swiss, the Germanic vector. Don't ask me how that happened, but that's what it was. Now, and then you see, for instance, you know, the share of foreign currency <coughs> denominated. In other words, foreigners owned the debt of these very modest households. And I can assure you, this is also happening here in Italy. This is happening in many countries. That very modest household debt, because you have millions of them, actually is worthwhile the big banks. It's just one little element in an ocean of such elements. This is disturbing. I repeat, when the local bank owns that, that's one thing. Because a local bank wants the sons and daughters to be its clients, as I already mentioned. But if it is a foreign <coughs> bank, that is, that's just not right for if you want the smaller cities that you are so interested in, right? The smaller cities, if they can recirculate, like a city like this one, right? If you can recirculate whatever the money whatever the monies that are in circulation uh, from the local enterprises and households, that is much better than sending it to a foreign bank. Uh, <coughs> in short, extractive sectors can extract even from modest households. <coughs> this is very important. We tend to think modest households, who's going to bother? Oh no. And, and we have a whole whole new set of data now that, that shows that also. Now here's another extractive mode. I do like music, but perhaps we can put it down a bit, right? Um, so when, neighbor, when, when modest neighborhoods become part of global finance, I'm going to run through this very quickly. I have already alluded to it, but the basic idea is when you're dealing with high finance, I repeat, you're dealing with algorithmic mathematics. Algorithmic mathematics, physicists do that. It's brilliant stuff. You can transform anything into a workable asset. It's the stuff of genius. When you walk into Goldman Sachs, you know, the famous bank, the back room, back room where the secretaries, a hundred secretaries used to sit, now, it's a hundred physicists, Phys physici, no? And so I don't hold them accountable or I don't blame them, you know, they're just developing their stuff. But what algorithmic mathematics allows you to do, 
as I already said, is financialized just about anything. And poor housing, low-income housing, is now at the top because there is so much of it in the world. So what do you have? You transform what we see as a poor, modest house into an asset, an abstract asset that represents a material good. The high investment circuit, I repeat, wants assets, asset-backed securities. They do not want derivatives. As you know, some of you know, derivatives is the dominant mode that they're selling to our pension funds. You know, the derivative is not a good instrument. You may recall that in Italy, 14 municipal governments went suddenly broke the same day, the same time of day. They had gotten a derivative. They thought they had gotten a loan. Un prestamo. No, it was a derivative. A derivative is micidiale, eh? as you say in Italian. I love that term. Uh, here are all the foreclosures. Now, this is just the United States. We're talking about... Uh, 15 million households getting, being persuaded to sign a contract and going broke because the instrument went broke, all at the same time, more or less. But it, it was a period of, the whole thing took about eight years. Now, 16 million households, that's a lot of people. And in the United, this is the United States, this instrument is now also in Germany, it's in Italy, it's in several... Huh? Now, 16 million people, families, households, not people, households. In other words, it's like 30 million people. That's twice the population of the Netherlands. I'm Dutch. We are just 16 million. In a short period of time, that's, that's like a military deployment for war, if you want to think. But you know what? It was invisible. We could not see it. And let me assure you, that is an advantage of a small city, since we're also concerned about small cities. That small cities, that would not happen. I don't, maybe it will at some point, but it's not happening now. But in big cities, the stuff that is happening is amazing. I recommend also a film called Push, un film, in nuovo, giusto uscito that is called uh, PUSH. And it's all about these kinds of issues. It's an extraordinary film. It has already won several prizes. It just came out. PUSH is PUSH is como empuje, no? You push them out. Uh, <clears throat> now here is, this instrument has entered uh, Europe, and we have had quite a few of losses of homes, even in Germany. Germany, which mostly does not buy housing, it sort of has rented. Uh, now, the outcome of all of what I described is the emptying of urban land. When you pay attention, also in Milano, or you know, you see that there are empty buildings. In New York, we have quite a few empty buildings, and that's interesting in itself. Footnote: eh? little acotación al margen. Uh, that empty building can be financialized and can deliver more profit than if it were occupied. This is extreme. And this is all, again, via brilliant methodologies that have nothing to do with traditional banking. Now, this is very, 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 very extreme, and you are not going to see it easily in most cities, but it is happening. Uh, I wanted to just show you a few figures. I don't know if you can see. Can you see that in the back? Si può, si può leggere questo? Si? Yes. Ah, bene. So this is, this is a final point. And I, I should say, uh, before I forget, that a lot of these negatives that I'm describing are happening in big cities. Small cities are really privileged in today's world because you are protected, in a way, by your size, by the fact that you're a small city, from these very aggressive methodologies that extract value, even where you least expect it. Huh? So, uh, good for the small cities. Now, here we have just, these are just a few examples of the buying of property. 
that is happening in major cities. The, the full list is 100 cities, <coughs> but these are the major ones. And that is not good either. That is something that, that we don't know where it goes. But there is a lot of buying by foreign and national of, uh, of big buildings. And uh, this is just, just if you took, just as an example, just to point out one element, total foreign investment in property. Look at London and New York, they're at the top. But you can see that it's all the major cities. That's just one year of buying. We're talking trillions of just buying property. And it's not clear for what that property is used. Again, the small cities, you have still a web of active economics. This is passive economics. This is just buying to own the assets so that you can do something else. It has nothing to do with housing, per se. And that is, that is why the, the, I'm really beginning to develop respect for the small towns, because you have sort of a network situation that, that, that makes tissue, sticky tissue. And so you need each other a bit. Here are some other elements for those of you who are interested. I'm leaving the slides, but it's a bit too fanciful, probably. Um, but, uh, right, yeah, I'm just going to skip this. And here are, yeah, let me just. Now, sort of to begin to conclude, the notion of the material, we tend to think of the material as something that tells us a truth. A wall is a wall. That metal thing is what it is. And so I have become very interested in trying to capture the extent to which the material is failing us. We exist in a zone of innocence. We think that the wall is the wall. <laughs> when you can financialize that wall, it ceases to be a wall. It is no longer a wall. Now, I'm sure that this building is not financialized, but I want to say that many buildings are. We think it's a wall, but it's something else. It becomes an asset you know, that is floating. It could be a piece of the wall, it could be whatever. So, you know, and in that sense, when the material does not quite tell us as it is. Um, this is something that, that sort of is an illustration. It's just one very partial illustration of what I was describing as when the material does not quite tell you what it is. So this is the Tim's. Huh? in London. This is a set of very luxurious buildings. This is an area, you see the river there, I don't know if you can see it, eh? but sort of it's very central London. It's very famous. It has a lot of beautiful buildings. Uh, I never go there because it's so crowded with tourists, <coughs> but there was a journalist who said, let's go walk those areas that you're always describing. So we went for a walk, and as I was walking, I heard these, the tourists say, ah, oh, look at those lovely British buildings. These buildings are all owned by one Chinese company. Now, I don't have anything about the Chinese. Again, the material, what concerns me is that the material lacks speech today compared to earlier periods. When the material was the X, was the X. This is an X that could be anything. It's not an X, it's the X. So all of those are owned by one foreign company. And again, I just want to emphasize, it's not the foreignness, it's the fact that we can't see it, that we think that we're seeing what we're seeing, we're seeing something else. These are nice British buildings, yes, but. Now, you may know that the, the Qatari royals, huh, the Qatari royals, uh, they now own more of central London than the Queen of England, which is also an invisible event. I thought it's sort of cute, frankly. No, è bello, no? Questi Qatari hanno più proprietà di London centrale che la reina di di Inglaterra, no? è un elemento abbastanza interessante. Um, now, looking at the top, these top 100 cities, just very quickly, 
that I have been working on uh, that are sort of top, you know, rich in terms of wealth, in terms of power. 10% of the world's population, they represent 30% of the world's GDP, 76% of property investment. Uh, the total value of financialized properties is 217 trillion, which is more than the global GDP of all the countries in the world. It tells you two things. One is that, wow, there is a lot of property acquisition, etc. But the other one is that GDP doesn't quite tell you nowadays the full story of what is happening. GDP per capita worked very well until the 1980s. After that, it really became a more problematic measure. Um, and this is just an image. This is Lon the larger London area, very larger London area, and these are all properties, 65,000, all owned by foreign entities. This is again in London, by foreign entities that are outside London. Not one of them has a name. They're all numbers. 65,000 properties, bigger London area. What is that? And one possibility is that those buildings are not being used as buildings. They're assets. It's asset-backed securities that you can build off them. And we don't have names, we don't have anything. So these are very alarming developments. So, and here we have these empty towers in, in Manhattan, which are just standing there empty, but they're delivering the goods because they, they can be transformed into assets. Um, so I want to conclude, are we dealing with a new systemics in cities? It's very partial. It's a tiny, tiny slice of whatever happens in a city whether those are the big cities that I've been referring to or smaller cities. So it's a very tiny, but it's like a, a very powerful vector that installs itself in these cities. And one, again, I want to sort of end with this notion, a logic of extraction, even where you do not expect it, like very modest houses, uh, public housing complexes, they're being subjected there is one firm, which I cannot name, that has bought across Europe, in the United States, and moving into Asia, low-income housing complexes. Not because they're interested in the housing. They're interested in the materiality that it is, because it functions as an asset. So this is a whole new zone. Okay, now I'm going to leave this. Uh, what I've talked about is about major cities. And what is alarming about that condition that I have described is that they are distorting the notion of a city. A city is a place where actors from different worlds can have encounters. It's a place for making. And in that sense, the mid-sized cities, which have been overlooked a bit, by this financializing capability, mid-sized cities are actually a gem to be protected. We just want to make sure that they, um, that they, that they stay on. Uh, so in rural areas, what we're seeing is destruction of habitat. But the housing question hasn't quite happened. I'm trying to get, so at its most extreme, we see two rising urban formats. But this is the extreme condition. Europe does not fit that image. And it's this. The, the, you know, the lower income people and the high rising. There is a real sense in big cities, again, not in Europe, that we have these two worlds rising. Very, very high end complexes, rich wealth, and then sort of, uh, sort of an impoverished, uh, you know, larger area. And when there is no land, we're building the cities on water. So I leave you with these very unhappy thoughts. Thank you very much. Grazie, molte grazie.